Oh, here's a uh, video I've never shot before. I've never even shot a video remotely on this topic. A project you did in Industry 4.0 that you had the most regret on. And there's an, you know, there's an important lesson here, and that's why I decided, yeah, I'd, I'd go ahead and answer it. Um, the project was, uh, um, we were brought in um, by a company, a company um, in discrete manufacturing. I, I don't want to mention the industry or anything. Um, basically, uh, linear processes, uh, discrete manufacturing, um, taking. They were the secondary step in additive manufacturing, so they were they weren't quite taking raw material from the earth. And doing something with it, but they were taking the uh, they were taking the raw material that had been processed once, and they were turning it into consumer goods that you would sell in the store. Um, the way the engagement went was um, we were initially um, the initial engagement started from a member of their IT department who was a I think he was a process engineer, a continuous improvement engineer sort of a hybrid of many different roles, super smart guy, hyper, hyper, hyper organized. Um, he reached out to us and asked us to uh, come out, specifically asked for me, uh, to come out and review one of their locations um, and basically give them assessment. He, he the, the, the use case that they were thinking of um, was basically building manufacturing execution on one of their production lines. Their plant had, I think, maybe six production lines. Um, long process, so there was a, like, uh, I think, uh, like a printing process in the beginning, um, early on, even though they weren't doing any printing, it was essentially the same thing, same types of stands, festoons, the whole deal. Then from there, there was a small amount of surge capacity, and then they went into um, a process where they were converting the surge capacity into the actual finished good, and then there was packaging and palletizing. But it was all one continuous process, right? And there were three levels of surge capacity in the production line. Um, and they were looking for basically MES functionality. Now, you know, we did the traditional digital transformation maturity assessment um <coughs> bless me process um yeah i met with their leadership talked a lot about values and mission one of the things that i wanted to ascertain from their leadership what their president who was uh, on site was how they viewed and i asked this question of executive leadership all the time it's one of the most important questions that you ask in the initial engagement right and that is when you're quantifying where that organization stands today. It's how they view their human resource. So, you know, generally what I'll do is I'll go into an, a, a, you know, if I'm going in front of the board of directors or I'm going in front of their operations groups, think uh, director level and above. And the first question I'll ask is, do you guys believe that you're the smartest people in your organization? And I actually ask it that obtusely, you know, to kind of get everyone's attention. Like, hey, no one talks to us that way. Um, and so I did that same thing with, with the president of this company. And um, what, it, what you want to hear and you want them to mean it is that the people on the plant floor are the smartest, smartest people in the organization. I am a firm believer. <laughs> I am an absolute firm believer that the most valuable asset in any manufacturing organization are the rank and file employees who do the actual work on the plant floor. And that if you can use technology to enable them to unlock potential in the business, that is solve their own problems, um, that is your pathway to long-term viability, no matter what your business strategy is, right? Firm believer. And I mean, I, I can prove that empirically over and over and over and over again, that enablement of the employee of the future with technology is the path to buy long-term viability in the manufacturing sector. But, so I, I'm trying to ascertain when I'm doing the values and mission is, does are the clients that I'm talking to, do they 
think the same thing. Because if they don't, we're not right for each other. Um, because our our focus is going to be on unlocking potential um, on the plant floor, and their focus might be to engineer out people altogether, right? Which is a fool's it's a fool's errand. Um, that doesn't mean that you can't automate out dangerous or inefficient positions that human beings are in, but you you may be engineering out that functionality that or that capability that functional that function that they do but you're reappropriating them to an area where they're more efficient, specifically centered around data analysis and unlocking potential. So I, I was talking to this president, and I um, and our client was in the room, the, the guy who brought us there, and I asked him, you know, what does he think of his people? And, and you know, in not so many words, he, he didn't think very much of them at all. And he, it was clear that he was the type of executive who did everything in his power to exploit those who uh, were subjugated to his power. Um, it was clear that he and I did not think the same things uh, about people and the employee of the future. And so I knew, hey, this guy, you know, this guy's dead, right? He's, he's an old school thinker. Unless this organization's in a shit ton of trouble, if this is the guy who's in charge. Um, and... Um, so I went back to my team. Uh, I, there was another person that went out with me. We went back with my team, back to our offices here in Dallas. I wrote my assessment and said to our team, "Hey, listen, we don't want to work with these guys. You know, this is this isn't, you know, this." And and I, I talk about this all the time in our in this business. We we only work with a fraction of the people who reach out to us, like a fraction of the people who want us to do their projects. Do we work with? We only work with the organizations we can be most successful with. Number one. Well, number one, it's the people who need our help, not they they could get by with someone else's help, right? If they need, if they specifically need us, then we're going to prioritize them. And number two, where the secondary priority is that we can actually help them, we can be successful, and a function of that is common values, common mission. So I went back to the team and just said, "Hey, listen, you know this isn't right for us, and let's not do it." I said, "This guy doesn't get it," although you know. By the way, most integrators are going to do the project. <laughs> and this is one of the things I'd love to change about our industry is is to get them, get integrators to stop doing work that they're not qualified to do simply because they want the sale. And, um, you know, a good question that you should ask integrators is, you know, what percentage of work, what percentage of opportunities that they could get to close do they actually accept? Um, and I think what you'll do is find out that the vast majority of integrators, the vast majority of consultancy firms don't care whether or not that client's right for them. They just care whether or not they sell it and then they figure it out later. That's, that's the predominant. Um, so we sent the email to our client saying, Hey, listen, you know, you know, we're just, we're not right. You know, this, we're not right for each other. Um, and, uh, we're going to pass. And, uh, and I, and I, in the pri in the, in my direct customer, I gave him the direct assessment. I said, Hey, listen, this is the issue with this guy in charge. You guys are screwed. Um, he, you know, this, this guy is not going to be able to lead you and you're not going to be able to transform his thinking. He's not a transformative leader. He's not going to be able to lead this initiative. He's at, and his motivations, what he's trying to get out of this is the opposite of what he should be trying to get out of it. It's the opposite of what's best for the, your organization and your people. So there are other, there are plenty, and I said there are plenty of other integrators that'll come do this project for you happily. They know they they know the same things we do, but they're happy to come do it for you. I mean, they're going to take your money. So, but you're not going to get what it is you're looking for. You know. Um, fast forward about a month, he respond. He sent another email, and he basically asked for a phone call, and then he basically begged me to do the project. He basically said, the only, ch you know, I agree with everything you said. The only chance we have is, the only chance we have is if we bring in a company like you to, it, to change his thinking through the conversion of value. And I really like this guy, um, the client, um, you know, there was a, you know, kindred spirits between us and um, you know, 
and, and I, against my better judgment, I decided we would do the project. We'd go ahead and do it. You know, he talked me into it. I went against my gut. I went against what I knew to be true, and I agreed to do it. And, you know, we got started, uh, you know, we start, we get about maybe eight weeks in, give or take, and, you know, there were more warning flags, there were more warning signs, um, and, uh, you know, just kind of stupid stuff, you know, I, I, not, I don't want to say stupid stuff, it was serious, it was, you know, serious stuff, it was, um, you know, the, they, they had set up like a, our, our engineers were all working remotely and they had set up, they had set up like a, they had set up like a monitoring thing. Uh, so while our engineers were working on the project, um, their engineers could basically monitor the actual development our engineers were doing. And they did that without telling our engineers so, like, one of our engineer, one of our female engineers, who was, you know, pretty opinionated, you know, she was like, you know, this is fucking creepy. You know, it's creepy that this guy's, like, watching me work. It's the equivalent of somebody standing, like, over my shoulder. And, and she was talking about how, you know, she'd be working and, and he basically had a monitor up on the wall watching her do her development. And then he would send her a message in Teams you know, she wouldn't know he was watching and he would send her a message in teams. And it was sort of like, you know, imagine somebody standing outside your bedroom window and they call you and they're like, Hey, I really like the shirt you're wearing or something like, you know what I mean? So anyway, it, it, it freaked her out. Um, so, you know, we pulled her off the project. You know, I talked to their, I talked to their team. I'm like, listen guys, you can't, you know, we have, there are the agile project management methodology that we use is designed to have specific check checkpoints during the development. You know, if you it, it creates a high level of inefficiency during the de software development life cycle if what you're doing is critiquing each line right, as someone's is as, as someone's working through a problem, right? Um, so that was the first. That was like a huge red flag. Um, you know, I had to remove her from the project. You know, she b basically came to me. This is the first time I, this has ever happened. I've never had an engineer come to me and say. I'm not comfortable working on this project. I want to be off of it. You know, I've had people say, I'm, you know, I'm getting close to burnout. We try to anticipate that before they ever get to us. But, you know, I've had somebody say, oh, I'm, I'm getting burnout on this. I want to work on something different. I've had that happen, but I've never had somebody eight weeks in say, I'm uncomfortable working on this project. This is kind of creepy, whatever. And there was nothing untoward that the client was doing. It wasn't a, it was just weird, you know? So that was one red flag. Uh, another red flag was I had to, I did an update. I went out there about six weeks in. They insisted that I be the, the lead on the project, the architect. You know, they wanted me on it. I went out. I had a meeting with the president again and a couple of other people, and it was a, it was a, a board meeting, board style meeting. We're six weeks in. We're supposed to be collecting, functional capability requests. You know, and, not a fucking person in the room said a word. I mean, we're talking like. 14, 15 people, managers, supervisors, uh, you know, operations directors, and no one said a word, nothing, crickets for an hour and a half. I mean, literally, I, I would ask a direct question, and everyone would give a one word yes or no answer. I would ask open ended questions, and they would still answer yes or no, or most likely, I don't know. And it became very clear that there was not a culture of expression like the president in the room. So what I did was, and I generally do this, what I'll do is I'll say anybody in the room, and this is what I did. I said, anybody in the room who um, has someone who reports to them in the room, I need you to leave. So if you have a direct report who's in the room with you, um, I need you to leave. So that all I have in the room are people at the bottom rung who don't, there's no bosses in there. And I spent about 30 minutes with them asking questions like, hey, why is it no one's talking? What's the, and, um, and at first they wouldn't say anything. I said, listen, this is completely anonymous. I'm trying to help your organization here. I've been hired to help your organization, you know, come out on the other, the, 
on the other side of the fourth industrial revolution, stronger, viable, you know, in business. So I need you to be honest with me. And everything you say here is completely anonymous. None of it's going to be written down. I just need it for my own guidance. And then the floodgates just opened. And it was all, nobody says anything. The culture there, they don't say anything because it's going to be used against them. Um, the, you know, the leadership is all looking to blame somebody for something. Um, there's not a, you know, people are, you know, they'll complain about the problem, not focus on the solution. It was a lot of these things. And I'm like, fuck, you know, I'm six, seven weeks in now. Should have gone with my gut. I knew it, but it's too late. Uh, I think our engagement was going to be about 16 weeks, give or take, um, total. And, um, it all came to a head about halfway through. Um, where uh, their leadership basically pulled that there was there was a issue or integration issue we ran into collecting data. We needed there were certain programs we needed from the PLCs we hadn't gotten yet. Um, we'd been waiting for those programs. There was an update in one of the palletizing lines or palletizing stations that we needed done for machine state. And we hadn't received them yet. So we get to the sprint review. Um, and we'd been talking about it in the huddle every single day. Hey, we're waiting on these things. This is a blocking task, you know. And uh, we get to the sprint review. And the president who's in there, he's not part of any of the huddles. He's not part of any of the... He's just in sprint planning and sprint review. He basically, you know, tries to turn it on us. And I listened to him go and go, you know. And I wrote my notes down. And, and then I just basically told him, like, well, I mean, basically nothing you just said was true. Like, here, here are the facts. And the solution is this. We have this person here who is, he's one of your three controls engineers. He's responsible for this data for us. He hasn't been able to provide that data to us. The reason he hasn't been able to provide that data to us at, by his own admission is that he keeps getting pulled off on other things. You, you signed on our charter that we protect the sprint at all costs. That the commitment to protecting the sprint hasn't been there. That's on you Mr. Customer. And, um, you know, he blew a gasket. And uh, so I just let him go, let him go, let him go. And then I asked everybody to leave the room. He and I, me, him, and another guy stayed in that room. It was just the three of us. It was a whiteboard. I said, listen, I'm going to draw on the board the solution to your problem. Okay? That is, if you want to get to your goal, I'm going to draw on your board how to get there. And... Um, and so I drew it, and I said, here are the next three steps we need to take. And after those next three steps, we either do it my way or we don't do it anyway. We won't be a part of this. It's either going to be I have absolute say as the architect over what we're doing here. Your job is to enable me to be successful. If you can't do that, we don't belong together. And he, was, he wasn't prepared to do that. Um, and the reality was it was just the wrong leader. He was a ter yeah, terrible leader. And it all came came true. So there was a there was also a vendor relationship, and I had to send a big email, you know, to the vendor, and basically, you know, and I just basically laid it out. I didn't, you know, I just basically said, here are the facts. Here's what happened. The, you know, these guys are not going to be successful. It doesn't matter who goes there. You got to get rid of this guy, and you got to, and you have to adopt this philosophy when it comes to protecting the sprint. And you, your priorities have to be in line in order for you to be successful here. Digital transformation is fucking hard, man. It's not, you know. It, it, you know, it's not like ordering a dumpster and having it delivered, you know what I mean? It's, uh, you know, you're putting together a, you know, an integrated, you know, integrated digital system um, from brownfield and greenfield um, um, nodes. So uh, in the debrief with our team, so after we cut the, you know, we severed the relationship and I think we, I don't know, refunded them their last... Uh, their last uh, sprint. I think what we did was we ended up eating the last sprint altogether. We just ate it. We just sent them the, their money back. Um, or maybe they hadn't paid it yet, and we just said we absolved them of it or something. Anyway, we in our debrief, what we said in as a team is, um, listen, we knew this wasn't right for us. Okay, we we knew it. We identified it. Our systems worked. Um, but we overrode those systems. We overrode our gut. And the lesson here is not to do that. <laughs> the lesson here is don't override the gut. Okay. 
um, all right. Anyway, you know, that, that was my biggest regret. It's the wor- worst project we ever had. Um, we haven't had anything similar to it. So, um, you know, I hope that was a valuable story for you guys and, uh, you know, like subscribe, um, share, comment, you know, all the stuff for the algorithm and I'll see you in the next one.